it. As you can see, this is the best session of the DrupalCon. Yes, yes. I don't know who can say that. It's, it's, fa it's factually correct, so I think it's legal. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm Matteo. I did work on getting JSON API into core recently, single directory components. And I work for this cool company, Lullabot. And we are employee owned. And actually, all of the work that I did for single directory component was sponsored by Lullabot. We have some internal time. And if you're curious on how we sponsor Drupal development, we recently wrote a blog post. And it's in our newly redesigned website. So go take a look. So my name is Mike Herschel. Uh, I have done a lot of Drupal core stuff also. I worked on the Oliveira theme and several other cool things. Most recently, I, I, uh, I, I kind of cheerleaded, I feel, to get Matteo to write most of the code for SDC. Um, <laughs> but uh, I work for Agilina, which is an amazing company that I am brand new with. Uh, we are hiring, so if anyone is looking for any positions, you can come talk to me. Um, you can see my website, social media, and all that good stuff right there. This is Mike and us here uh, doing the presentation, but others helped, and most notably, Lowry and, and Christina, they like joined forces from the beginning, providing help on figuring out what are the features that we want to include, making sure that we paid attention to developers new to Drupal as well, mm -hmm. and uh, that they were included and helped as part of this uh, of the work that we did. Pierre, he is the maintainer of the UI suite modules. If you don't know the UI patterns, uh, go check it out. Uh, it's pretty cool. And they've been working on many implementations of components uh, and in real life. So validation from their team was really helpful for us to make sure that uh, we were delivering it to core the best possible solution. And along those lines, Alex Pot and Lee Rowland, core committers, they were providing a lot of helpful feedback in the code that we wrote. <laughs> and it, it was, they helped making the best code base that we could have put into, into core. So thank you to all of those. So let's talk about what we're, what we're gonna talk about, right? Uh, so we're gonna talk about what we're fixing. What, what's, what's the problem here? Um, we're gonna discuss how SDC works. I'm gonna show a, uh, I'm gonna do this session of coding karaoke where I have a video where I'm actually converting a component to use SDC and I'm gonna narrate that for you. Um, we're gonna talk about how modules and themes can extend SDC, integrate into things like Storybook and Fractal, and then what's the future, and the future's super, super exciting. So um, before we get started, who here is a front-end developer? Who here has uh, done any type of, tried to do any type of component stuff in Drupal? Who here has felt pain? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like components in Drupal can like be a pain in the ass, right? But, but no longer. So, th so the problem that we're fixing right here is we, where is your CSS and JavaScript coming from? That's really difficult to figure out unless you have been in the Drupal ecosystem and you wonder and you realize how that works. If you're coming in from outside, everything's new and it's a little bit difficult. Like finding out where the assets are located is difficult. Um, the, the files that you're working with together are located, are scattered across the file system and it's really, really easy to lose context. We don't know what data is expected into a component and what data is mandatory for a component. And just locating your template can be difficult at times. Right, right. so here be patient with me. I'm a backend developer and I'm gonna speak about UI, okay? <laughs> but in my research when trying to build a system so front-end developers could work easily with components, I, I realize that components are um, more of a way of putting UIs together and uh, one defines a component as they need. Like a component is what you want a component to be. So there is no wrong way of saying this is a component. And you usually 
do that and uh, put it in a semantic way, so things that make sense together uh, into composing your, your UIs. And typically, in practice, what that means is some template and some styles and some JavaScript. And together, uh, you make like a, a rubber stamp that you stamp all over your site with the added benefit that you get input to your components, like those rubber stamps that you have a dial for the date, so you can change it every time that you stamp it, right? And we couldn't find any other tech stack that was not using components. Like everyone was having this huge component party and Drupal was not invited to the, com <laughs> to the party. So like Mike said, I was working on this problem space and I asked Mike if we could do what we do best and that's, we achieved making Drupal crash the component party, <laughs> right? <laughs> we took Drupal and we made it so you can add components easily and what that looks like in practice is, it's called single directory components. So it's just a directory inside of your components folder. Your components folder lives at the root of any module or theme. So you can provide components as part of your modules and as part of your themes. This directory contains JavaScript, CSS, and Twig template, and it also needs to contain some metadata, and that is how we will discover the component, and it can optionally contain documentation about your component uh, that will be very useful for other people that are using your component, and also can contain a thumbnail and other stuff. But these four are kind of the important files that a component contains. And one of the laser focus goals that we had is that everything has to be in that directory. Like, there are no hooks. You cannot alter a component from another module because that other module is not in your directory. And you cannot do anything else to your component that's outside of that directory. So the benefit of that is that when you are editing your components, you know where to go. And you know where to find the everything that's affecting that particular piece of your of your website. And also, as they say, good code is easy to delete. I don't know if, if you ever tried to refactor some CSS. I tried. I'm a backend developer. And I'm always afraid that that CSS may be used elsewhere. And I just Me don't too, touch Mateo. It. Me too. See? Yeah. So with the components, since that style only applies to that particular component, you know that you can refactor it and you can delete it if you need. This is a bad slide. Um, <laughs> but bear with me. Uh, this is just for the video. If you want to revisit this uh, and pause here and understand it a little bit better. But just pay attention to the start and finish. We will start with include and then the name of your component, the ID of your component, and that will produce some HTML and JavaScript and CSS. And that will happen in this two-step process, these dashed boxes. One is to find the plugin, the component, uh, where uh, that metadata file that I talked about, and the other step will just pass it to Twig, and uh, it will take that CSS and JavaScript, create a library for you, so you don't have to go and create a library anymore, because this, uh, this step will do it for you, and it will also attach it to the page, so you don't have to attach the library to, to the page anymore, right? All of that happens automatically. So you use include and embed from Twig, and you get HTML in result. You mind if I use your mic? So I am uh, doing this, co I have this video that is me coding and I'm gonna narrate it as I'm switching over component. One of the things that I want to uh, point out with this video is that the first, when I did this initially, it took me over an hour to do it. So I'm gonna do, do this in 10 minutes, I'm gonna go pretty fast. But the, uh, the URL with the full narration is at the bottom. And uh, so we can, 
within the Canvas slide deck, there's a uh, th there's a slide where we have all our resources. I'll give you. We'll we'll switch to that too. So, uh, unlike regular karaoke, this is coding karaoke, and unlike regular karaoke, I'm very sober. So, like, let's see if we can do this. So, this is the Florida Drupal Camp website. Florida Drupal Camp, of course, is coming up next year in uh, mid February. Uh, we're going to look at last year's schedule and the schedule items that you're seeing right here. Uh, we're going to refactor this into using a single directory component. So this schedule item is a details element. It has a lot of data, including title. It has those contextual links, etc. So uh, let's get started right here. The first thing we're going to do, and you should be pretty familiar with this step, is we're just going to disable CSS and JavaScript aggregation. This is, this is regular stuff right here. But what's new to Drupal 10.1 is you can now uh, turn on Twig development mode and disable caching through the UI. Now you can still do this through, um, through your settings.php and development.services.yaml. So when we look at this right here, we can see this is a regular component. This is the node-session-teaser.html.twig. So this is, what we're this, is what, this is our kind of starting point. This is what we're converting right here. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to do, uh, enable the single directory components module. This is just like normal. There's no configuration. Keep in mind that once SDC becomes stable, it's not going to be a module anymore. It's just going to be turned on all the time. So we have to do this uh, while we're experimental. Next, we're going to uh, install Drupal Core Dev. This is not mandatory. But what it does is it lets uh, the SDC module output really, really, really helpful error messages. And you're going to see these later, because I'm going to intentionally uh, show you some of that. So this is our starting point right here. This is our uh, node-session-teaser.html.twig. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a we're going to create a directory called components. This is where all your components are going to live. And then for each component, you create a new a new directory. We're going to call our component details, and we're going to have two files in here: details.components.yaml and details.twig. And we're going to move some other files in there in a second. For the YAML file, we're going to go to our documentation that we spent a lot of work on. And we have this example uh, components.yaml file. And this is going to be our starting point. So I'm going to copy and paste this in here. I'm just going to start deleting all the stuff I don't need. We're going to call this details. And we're, going to, we're not doing any replacement. We are going to have a schema in this. And so I'm, I'm basically just deleting stuff. But I want to know what the syntax is, because you know who can ever remember that? We are going to do a couple slots, so I'm going to have a placeholder there. And we're not doing any library overrides. You're going to learn more about that, all that other stuff later. Uh, next, we're going to copy in the uh, SAS file and the CSS file. And after we do that, we have to rename them. So we're renaming those to the name of the component. So that's details.css and details.scss. Uh, and of course, we have to update our SCSS to point to wherever it's pulling its variables from. So this is our starting point right here. So uh, let's uh, start building out our schema. But before we do that, we have to copy the HTML from the node-session-teaser and paste it into the new details.twig. And so let's kind of put everything side by side right here. And so our first variable that we're going to pass in is the attributes variable. And we don't quite know what this is yet. I know it's a Drupal class, and I'm going to show you later how to figure that out. So the next thing that we're pulling in is we're pulling in this classes array. So this is a type array. And all this type of stuff is in the uh, documentation, by the way. Label is the title, so that's just a string. We have two Booleans here, in here, is non-session and uh, is training. So we're adding those. And then we're pulling in uh, the big content. And that's, that's an object because it's an associative array. And if you get that wrong, SDC will give you error messages. That's really helpful. So URL is a string, and then title suffixes and an array. So um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to delete the code, uh, the markup out of the node-session-teaser. And we're going to create a, we're going to use the twig embed. And the format for this is the name of the uh, theme or module where the component resides, colon, and then the name of the component. We're going to pass in uh, all of our variables or props or whatever you want to call them. And um, so at this point, we're going to create a twig block. Now, a twig block is the same as a slot. So we're going to, we're going to call this block meta because it's metadata.
I'm going to paste this in here and make it look pretty. And then, of course, we have to add the placeholder for, the, uh, for that twig block within the details.twig. And we're going to do the same thing for the description right here. Now, I don't necessarily have to create these twig blocks, but I know, like for the Florida Drupal Camp website, that I, am, uh, I, have mul I have multiple content types using the same component, so I want these twig blocks in this case. So I'm going to do a little cleanup right here. I'm going to get rid of these set tags and just kind of uh, put those into the twig embed right here. I don't need to do this, but it's just a little bit of cleanup. And it's looking pretty good right here. So we're going to clear cache, and we're going to see if it works. So let's refresh. And of course, we have our favorite screen ever. But if you look at the error message, the error message is super useful. It says string value found, but a Boolean or an object is required. So, and it says, it says the, uh, the fields. So what that means is that these is non session and is training fields are actually passing in strings. So we're going to use twig ternary operators and force it to pass in Boolean. So let's uh, refresh one more time and see if it works. And it's working. So like, let's look at this. It's like, it's awesome, all right. So we know we're, we're getting pretty, pretty far here. Like, we're, we're pretty close, but we still don't have the attributes there. And we also forgot to do our slots. So I'm going to create the slots right here. So I have meta and I have description. Of course, I have to make sure my indentation is proper. And now like, let's figure out how do we figure out this attributes right here. So within Drupal 9.5 and later, the uh, dump function is basically a wrapper for, uh, for uh, Symphony var dumper. So I'm going to dump the attributes, and that's going to output on the screen right here. And you can see right there, at the, it says Drupal core template attribute. That's a class. So we're going to copy and paste that into the, uh, the metadata right there. And after that, we're going to uncomment this. I should have cleared cache here, but I totally forgot. But let's check to see if it works. And we can see everything's still working good, so like, yay. So there's a couple other things we want to do. We want to use the only keyword, and the only keyword will ensure that no additional variables, context, or anything else is being passed except for what we explicitly pass. And then we double check to make sure it's working. But it's not quite right. If you look at that, we're pulling in, we're pulling in an SVG from outside. And so I don't want that. Everything needs to be included in the component. So I create an image directory. And then I'm fumbling. You can see this. I'm fumbling around looking for this SVG right here. It takes me like a second, which reinforces the, the point where it's, it's hard to find things in Drupal, you know? So I finally find that, and I put it in here, right? So the next thing I need to do is how do I reference the path where I am? How do I get that file system, right? And so I'm going to use the dump function again. I'm not going to pass in any parameters. And when I look at this, I see at the bottom right here, I see the, uh, an array with component metadata. That is, uh, the SDC module creates this. And so I do a couple things wrong here, by the way. So the first thing, I, I needed to use a, a key inside of that, but you can, see, you can watch me troubleshoot. I'm also, uh, in the case right here, I'm converting the include tag to an include function, which is best practice, because at some point the include tags are going to be uh, deprecated. So I'm trying to figure this out right now, and I don't realize that I actually have an unclosed parentheses because everybody does that, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm figuring that out, and then I realize, all right, well, it's not just component metadata. I actually need to figure out what's inside of that. And you can see the path key at the top tells me where this is located. So what I need to do right here is I need to put component metadata.path. Is it going to work? No, it's not going to work because I still have, like, I got my directory wrong. So I need to update my directory. It's IMG, not images. <laughs> and now it's working. So yay. We're, we're, like, you can see this little SVG that we were wrestling with right there. And uh, we're not quite done yet. We have to update our uh, CSS. So, like, normally this would be done in the SAS, but I don't have my gulp file updated. But anyway, so I copy the, uh, the image in. And then I just update the CSS to use, uh, to use uh, relative, relative paths. I double check to make sure it's working. And you can kind of see it is, that little, S, that little PDF icon. And there's a couple more things that we still need to do. We need to declare what is required here. 
So in this particular case, our, our classes are required, our label is required, and our content is required. So let's just declare that. A couple other cleanup items. We can now delete this session teaser library that I previously created. It's no longer needed because SDC automatically creates that for us. When we look at this in DevTools here, we can see it says component start. You see it says component start, the theme name, and then the uh, component name. And it gives you that handy dandy emoji right there. That emoji is randomly generated. And it's really useful because it gives you that visual indicator. And it's really useful if you have nested components, which is going to be a frequent use case. So this is our, where we're ending up right here. This is our details.component.yaml. And you can see it, it describes exactly what is expected, what is required. And that's, like, that's very, very useful right there. When we switch over to the node-session-teaser, you can see how the data is passed to that. And it's very clear what happens. And then when we switch over to the details.twig, at this point, all we have is we have the markup, and then we have the uh, placeholders for all your data in right there. And it's pretty straightforward. So that, that, is, that is it right there. And I know I went really, really fast, but this is going to be up on YouTube, so y'all can like slow down a bit. And ta-da. <laughs> That was pretty impressive, Mike. I practiced a lot. <laughs> and you revealed that this all was a very contrived way of getting emojis into Drupal Core. <laughs> so let's talk about the metadata, because that's probably the stuff that seemed more foreign to everyone. Uh, so the good news is that none of it is required. So you just pass in no, and SDC will be happy with you. Um, that's true if you're defining your component in your themes. Uh, not true if you're defining it in your, in your modules. Right? In your modules, you will need to define the metadata. But it is highly encouraged that you define the metadata. So let's keep evolving this. Uh, first, you can start defining a human readable name, a description, so others know what the component does and then the status of the component, if it's stable, if it, uh, it's experimental, obsolete, or deprecated. And then the, the MIDI stuff starts, right? You, thank you. You should start defining your inputs, the inputs of your component, not your inputs, the inputs of your component. And that uh, is done using uh, a spec called JSON schema. Uh, you saw, uh, in Mike's video that he was just providing the type. So that's valid. You just provide the type if it's a string or whatever. In this example, I'm going a little bit further. I'm giving it a title, a description for the, for the input. In this case, the think component takes uh, an input called mail, and it also provides a format for it. So if you, in your development uh, machine, you provide some string, which is valid, but it's not in an email format, it will complain. It will throw an error message, not in production, but in your machine, it will throw an error message saying, well, you're not mapping an email field, right? So that's, that's useful. And there are other constraints and validations like minimum and length, and there's a lot of stuff you can do in JSON schema. You are not supposed to know everything that's in there, but if you're curious on the stuff that you can do, go to json-schema.org and you'll learn more about uh, what you can do and what you cannot do. And another thing that we had to do for the Drupal integration is extend the JSON schema to allow passing PHP objects, because that's something that we pass to, to our twig, right? And uh, it's not serializable into, into JSON. So you can also pass uh, the name of a class. So that's custom to Drupal. Ooh. So that's the most difficult part of the presentation. So if you got that, it's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> then slots are a little bit simpler. Uh, you just declare the machine name of the slot, in this case, body. Uh, but you can give it also a title, a description. And you can say if it's required or not. Right? In the example, Mike was just passing an, an empty object. That's fine, too. And finally. <laughs> While we said that uh, single directory components will generate a library for you, uh, for your CSS and JavaScript, 
sometimes you will need to tweak it, right? Uh, sometimes you will need to add an attribute for a JavaScript file or add additional JavaScript files. And I realize this is the version that we didn't update. So this should say JavaScript in there. And you can also add dependencies. Uh, like if your JavaScript depends on uh, Drupal once, then you can declare it here. So basically, you add this key library override, and everything that you would write in your library's YAML, you can put in here to override what the automatic uh, library will provide. But you probably won't use this very often, right? So if you're overwhelmed, uh, which would be understandable, because this is probably new to everyone here, uh, go to the annotated sample. There's uh, like it explains every option and what it does, and it has comments. And uh, my, maybe you want to follow what Mike did there and copy it and just paste it in the in your in your metadata. One last thing that is special about the metadata is that we are aiming for components to also become the building block for theme compatibility. Now, I don't know if you know this, but uh, there's uh, this base theme classy in Drupal core, and it was developed a very long time ago, and then it got frozen in time, because many other themes started depending on Classy, and everything in there became an API. So we could not change a single HTML class or tag, because then we break so many sites, right? So that is a problem, and uh, we want to address that for core and for contributed themes. So by doing components, we also uh, aim to make these components become the compatibility layer for for themes. So moving forward, we want themes to, to say, here's the list of my components. Anything inside of the components may change at any time, but here are my inputs. And I will maintain compatibility of those. So this is how you use it. And when you're extending that theme, then you can replace components. And how you replace components is by adding this replaces key into your uh, into your component. So you take the component, you copy that directory. So components are copy and pasteable, if that's a word. You put it in your inside of your theme, and you add this replaces key. So what that will do is let's imagine that there is this thing component that prints a yellow puzzle piece, and you want it blue, right? So you replace it. You copy the component, you paste it in your theme, and then you tweak it. You just forked it, right? And to do that, there are a couple of requirements. The original component needs to have metadata, so it's optional, but if you want it to be replaceable, you need to add the metadata, because uh, let's imagine that a module provides a component, and you are using that component uh, but also a third-party module uses that component. So the inputs need to be compatible. So we're checking that, right? And that's why everyone needs to uh, declare the metadata there. And then, since you're forking it, you are maintaining it from that point moving forward, and you have full control on it. Uh, so this puzzle piece, I decided it should be blue. You could make it blink and shoot lasers. Like, really, you can do anything, right? And Again, you can only replace components inside of a theme, because when you're replacing it, you're changing how it presents, right? And you do that through themes. So all that's done. That's, uh, that's bundled inside a core, and it's been committed. And you can start using it now, if you're using Drupal 10.1, which you are, I'm sure. <laughs> but. But we are not stopping here. Uh, we have a more, we have a broader vision on what to do with components, right? Uh, but the first thing that we need is help from you, from module maintainers and theme maintainers, to start shipping components. We want components to become 
mainstream and boring and something that it feels like we've been doing forever. So when, every, when components reach to everyone, they bootstrap the innovation of cool modules that do stuff with components, right? They learn about your components using the metadata that we talked about, and they do some other stuff. Like, for instance, uh, something that we want to do is to turn components into a site building tool, right? Imagine that uh, instead of going to your theme and writing a template for your field, you could go to the manage display tab and say my label field and then select the component that you want to render it with and then say, well, use the heading compo component for this field. And for this other field, for the tag field, use the peel component, right? So that's a, a good way of applying the components that may come from a base theme or that you are development, developing to use them inside of your, your site. Uh, another good way of uh, using components as a site building tool could be maybe in Layout Builder, you drag your component into the page and you put your card in there and maybe even go further and you have a WYSIWYG button where you click it and you have a component pop up and since you're describing your inputs, you can generate a form automatically for that. So the site builder can type uh, whatever they, they want for that button in there, a like button. Another goal that we have is that we want to make components the most enjoyable way of writing interfaces in Drupal. So we want to leverage existing tools like Storybook, stuff that the JavaScript folks have been using like for a long time, like uh, live reloading. They type in some CSS and they see it change. Like that instant feedback that the developer has in their local machine, uh, we are now able to access those, right? And we want to leverage and integrate with uh, existing tools. And most importantly, we don't want to maintain it. Like we can just use Storybook or other tools. Yeah, so uh, let me switch back to the Canvas slide deck and see if that's working any, any better. Because we have a couple slides at the end right here that I think would be useful. So first of all, this, um, this is one that would be good to take a picture of if you're, if you're going to take a picture. We have all the URLs up here. and. Um, we spent a lot of time on the documentation. The documentation is on Drupal.org, of course, but we have a quick start guide, which you can just copy and paste code. We have, of course, the annotated example, uh, uh, annotated component YAML. Um, we're working on an FAQ, and we just have like a lot of a lot of the details, you know, uh, in there. Uh, there, you can see uh, my YouTube narration right there. Please like and subscribe. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> We're in the uh, components channel in Drupal Slack. And uh, Mateo wrote an SEC examples module that just has a bunch of examples in there. So we need your help. We're going to be sprinting tomorrow. We're going, to try to, we're going to try to be converting core components over to SDC. Now, we can't get these committed until SDC becomes stable, which we're hoping to get done you know, for 10.2. Um, but we want people to get used to this and get, get working on it because it's really, really cool. And we also want you to write articles and talk about SDC. We can't be the only people out here doing it. Go to your Drupal camps and talk about it. Maybe like there will be a tutorial on Drupalize Me or something like that, Joe. Um, and uh, join us in Slack. And if you have questions, reach out and ask us. So yeah, uh, thank you, and ta-da. Ta-da. And we will take questions. Go ahead. So if we're looking for something to contribute to tomorrow and we show up and have go you, you'll give us something to do? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the answer was, is the question yes or no? And the answer was yes. Um, <laughs> now, the answer, uh, uh, you asked, if you find us tomorrow in the, contrib in the contrib room and you find us, we will, we will find something for you to do, something to convert, and we will help you out. So we, we have several uh, f focus areas for contribution, and 
One of those is writing components and then reporting how that felt, right? We can address still some stuff on making it stable. Uh, other areas are like writing documentation or reading our, the documentation that we wrote and improving it because we deeply believe that documentation can lower the barrier of entry for other developers and like we are not good people to write the documentation because we wrote the stuff and we know how it works, right? So yeah, sure, if you come and want to help, we'll find ways. Yes. So the question is, can you explain how this will work with CL components and CL server? And some people may not know what, what these are. Uh, CL components is the initial implementation of SDC in core. Uh, so I was happy at leaving it as a contrib module, but then Mike approached me and was like, we should get this into core. And I was like, get out of here. And then he started uh, convincing me. And no, I was trying to find a nicer way. Um, so CL components is probably going to stay like it is. It, it works for many people. It has like more than 7,000 installs at this point. And uh, it has evolved into SDC. But the surrounding ecosystem of modules like CL server, they have version two, and those are compatible with SDC in core. So they're very similar. There are some subtle differences between CL components and single directory components. Uh, so migration hopefully will be easy if you want to do it, or you, if you're happy with how they are, then you can say. Over here. So the, the question is, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can uh, you say I, that I again? Yeah. Okay. So the question is, is there any, any backwards compatibility issues when we, you know, when we have SDC enabled? Um, will regular twig theming continue to work as twig theming wants to work? And the answer is yes, SDC is optional. SDC is completely optional. You have to, like right now there's a module, but eventually it'll just be in core. But then you have to, you know, do your twig include and twig embed. If you don't do that, it'll just work like normal. Or it will, it'll work as is. In the back. I think that's a Dave Reed module, right? The, the, we, have to, we have to repeat the question. Oh, yes. Uh, the question is, I saw that SDC is in Drupal 10.1 uh, in core, uh, but I saw also a contrib module that has compatibility with Drupal 9. And uh, the background on that is that when I forked CL components to become what we wanted to put into core, I created that laboratory module called SDC. So it matches what it's currently inside of core, uh, but there are some subtle differences to make it compatible with Drupal 9. So there are like different branches, and I believe that in, in the project page, it uh, says which branch you need to install depending on your version of Drupal. Um, a coworker, Dave Reed, uh, maintains the Drupal 9 backport, uh, and I think it works, yes? Anyone else? The SDC and the UI pattern are very similar in terms of structure. But the UI pattern ecosystem is rather big, where you can think of a few some weird different disk framework, some with a queue, queue for example. And it, it is rather useful for the theming. And the SDC, you mentioned that you want to Simple, no hook, easy to find with. So I want to know, like, if SDC is 
going into cars, how is it the economy are really together with the UI partners? Whether they be redundant or what are the evolution or direction of the things going to be? So the question is, um, as this is in core, but there also exists this uh, other way, rather popular, called UI patterns. And UI patterns allows you to do so many other features, like integrations with views, display modes. It lets you pre-process stuff, do things outside of the, mm, of the directory. And how is that compatible, if it is, or how they play together? We talked a lot with the maintainers of the UI pattern module. And uh, our hope was that they could just base their module, their suite of modules, on top of single directory components. So what they will do, and uh, I'm speaking as of last week, their plan is to remove a significant part of their code because now SDC takes that place and build on top of that. So we, everything in UI Suite will keep on working as it has been working, but they will now depend or build on top of what's in core. At that point, you uh, so the question is, what if you have what if you have some JavaScript and CSS that you want to reuse al along many different components? So uh, what I would do is I would create a library just as normal right now, and then within those components that need to use that you need to depend on that library, you include that library overrides key and declare your dependency there. Does that make sense? So the library overrides. Mm -hmm. There's a library overrides key. So you can, you can see this right here. So library overrides allows you to override the automatically generated library. And so uh, single directory components will automatically generate a library. And that library, it will look for a component.css, a component.js. And if it sees those, it'll include those in a library and automatically make that for you. Now, obviously, you might have multiple JavaScript files, or you might need to declare dependencies. In that case, within your uh, metadata file, you declare like, your library overrides. And then your, uh, the syntax is very similar to what's in your libraries, your themes, libraries.yaml file. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Mark? So, so will this work with like uh, atomic design schemas where you can have subfolders of your uh, atoms, molecules, and all that stuff as well? So is it yeah, that's a good question. So uh, the question is, will this work in like a nested directory tree? Like say you're using atomic design where you have your, your at, you might have your components directory, then an atoms directory, and then your components. And the answer is yes. You can create any type of arbitrary nested, you know, directory structure and it'll, it'll scan all those and look for them and find them. Uh, go ahead. So the question is, um, when you're extending a component or when you're overriding a component, do, I just, do you need to just copy in one of those files or do you need to copy the whole thing? And the answer is you need to copy the whole thing. And, and some of the reason for that is that without copying the whole thing, you would then need to look in two places to find how the end result is rendering, right? And, and we don't allow that. Yeah. Yes, no, exactly. But you need to copy and fork everything. And from that point on, you maintain that fork of the component. So there is no inheritance. It's just replacement. So the question is, once you, we start seeing components coming through from different modules, different themes, is there a centralized place where you can make sense of everything that your site has? 
And uh, the answer is that not in Drupal core. Uh, Drupal core only lets you define and use components, but there are contrib modules. There is uh, one called CL Devel that will have a, a list of those, and for each component, it will tell you things like your metadata is actually correct, and it will tell you uh, you have all these files in there, and uh, these are your inputs, and it will kind of introspect uh, that. Uh, SDC examples also contain, apart from the component definition, storybook stories, and uh, that can help you build the um, the component library in Storybook. So you have two ways, right? Enabling a Drupal module that will give you an admin interface that is bare bones, but it has a list of components, or you can go like a little bit more uh, advanced and write stories and list them in Storybook. And we have a documentation page, as you see up here, that has a, uh, a list of modules that are currently compatible with uh, single directory components. Anything else? In the back. I can't, I, get, I couldn't hear all that. Can you repeat that a little bit louder, please? Yes, um, so, so, the, so the question is, is it easy for a theme to override a, uh, a, a component that is uh, defined in a module? And the answer is yes. So uh, what you would do is, number one, you would copy and paste that component. The, the compo only themes can, can override components, modules cannot. The schemas, of course, need to match, but you would copy and replace that component. And then this, you see at the bottom right here, we have this replaces key. You would put that in there. Then anywhere where that uh, component is called, the theme would override it. Are you there? Mm-hmm. What is your argument that you should switch your theme to use this? Like, what's the benefit of this metadata? Yeah, that's a good question, too. So, um, so, so the question is, like, let's say you implemented your own component solution, which a lot of us have, including myself. And, but it, and it's very close to this, but it doesn't have the metadata file. Why, why switch over to using this? And uh, the, the answer is, like, at, at some point, the ecosystem, the contrib ecosystem, is going to be able to make use of this. You know, and, and if you do not have a schema defined, at that point, um, it's, it's not going to work. Another thing that the, uh, that the single directory components module does is it automatically creates that library for you. So you don't have to define that library separately. Um, but, but yeah, those are, I think, the main benefits. Anything else? All right. Oh, all right, two more. Uh, I think over to the left first. Yeah. Uh, can you can you add? Uh, you said cash tags to the to the to the components. I'm trying to think of a of a use case because this is just passing in some data that already exists. So cache tags would be bubbling in for before you're using the component. So probably the answer is no, but if there is a use case for it, uh, maybe we can chat tomorrow in the contribution day and uh, talk about it and create an issue and work on that. But I cannot see um, a use case for, for that because most of the time, the cacheability, cacheability metadata rolls off the tongue. Uh, would, would be bubbling before you get to the component inclusion in the page. There's one more? Yeah, you mentioned um, basically creating keys for classes, or making them all this uh, architecture within the classes thing. If you're to override something within classes, would you then have to maintain, I guess, all the files that come with classes, or would there just be a set? So, so, so the question is, is like we talked about, like I, I, we we talked about we talked about classy a little bit, and and your question is like that we're moving stuff over from classy. We're not actually moving stuff over from classy. Classy is actually removed from Drupal 10. 
Uh, and we're, we, like, so within the, uh, within the Claro theme and stuff, we moved all of, like, those style sheets into Claro. The reason that we did, did this, as Matteo explained earlier, is because we couldn't change anything with Classy, and so the markup was so stagnant. You know, the markup was written for, like, Internet Explorer 8 or, you know, something like that. And uh, that made things really difficult. So, so yeah, so Classy is removed. Um, if, if, you're tr if you're moving a component, if you're converting a component into a single directory component, like I did earlier, you do, you, it would be best practice to extract the CSS, componentize it. Like if it's in a monolith, take it out of the monolith and put it in here. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so, so the question is, if, if we're overriding a, some, a, a component from something else, is it gonna, do, are we gonna override the CSS and all that type, type of stuff? The answer is yes. So when you override a component, you would literally copy and paste the whole directory. And that includes the, uh, and that includes like the CSS, and at that point, you're the owner of the CSS. And so everything on that is on you, and then you would use that replace this key right there. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that, that was pretty okay, cool. Anything else? Go ahead. Um, so I'm not a UI developer, so you know, pardon my ignorance. That's fine. Uh, but uh, I would, I have seen that a lot of these components that are built in each system, uh, each website, are uh, for for the same problem statement, right? So how do you ensure that you are not? I mean, the developers don't reinvent the wheel all over again when they start working on a new site, but use the uh, components which are on other sides. How, is, the, is there an easy way of searching to not just, you know? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. That's something we've been kind of spinning gears in our heads. Okay. So let me repeat the question first of all. Is like, a lot of developers will reinvent the wheels when they're creating their components. And, and how can we share components? And how can we do that? And that's a really good question. And like, so there's a lot of possibilities. But we're still really, really early right now, so we haven't figured out how we want to do this. But I mean, it's it's like right now you can distribute components in a module. So like let's say like I create a I could create a USWDS module, a USWDS components module, and that would have a whole bunch of components, and at that point the themes could extend that. But wouldn't it be cool if I don't know, like in addition to themes and modules on Drupal.org, maybe there was a components section or something like that. Or maybe if there was like, uh, like uh, the theme generator the command line, maybe there was a command line tool in Drupal or Drush that could automatically find something. All those are possible, but we kind of have to figure out where the community wants to go, what is, what is normal, and what's really useful. And, and, and also, this, this is something that a uh, prior initiative tried to, to achieve called Componi. And uh, there was a challenge of like people contributing components, like does it make sense outside of my site to share that component? Some are generic, some are not. Some, when, when some are generic and they need to be tweaked, uh, like forking that is kind of more work than starting from scratch. So there are lots of things to, to figure out, but it has been in our minds, yes. Okay. That's going to be the last one because uh, we need to dismiss this class. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, sorry. You, you get to ask the question and, and then that's it. <laughs> that's it. I say ask your question. That's a good question. Like right the, now, the macro, the, the, the macro syntax. You may have to repeat the question. Oh yeah, I do have to repeat the question. Thank you. <laughs> to, to tell you, uh, so, so the question is like, let's say we're using a macro, and we want to use that macro in several places and multiple components. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah. So, 
right now, I, I would believe it would just be like the standard macro syntax. To tell you the truth, when I'm working with macros, I'm doing a lot of copying and pasting. So I don't know that off the top of my head, but I think there's like a use statement where you, where you point to the macro. I'm assuming that will work very much the same, but that's something that we should try. You know, like one of, one of my goals that I have um, personally is like the Oliveira menu system is really usable, really, really robust. I would love to convert that into a single directory component. And of course, menu systems like that use macros. So at some point, I'm going to be working on this, and we're going to figure out if there is any, any pain in that. Um, right now, single directory components is experimental, which is really useful. So if we do need to work on this, it's a lot easier because with experimental modules, we don't have to worry as much about backwards compatibility. We still, because it's in beta, we still have to uh, define you know, a, a, a path, but if, if we need to change stuff, we're perfectly able to. And if I get to be a little bit selfish and ask if you will be coming to the contribution day tomorrow and explain me how to use macro so I can write a test <laughs> for that, that would be awesome. Well, I think that was the last one. Oh. So, so just for the sake of the recording, uh, Kat Shaw is saying that within the CL components module, which STC is based off of, uh, you have successfully used uh, macros, and they work as expected. Oh, there, there you go. All right, so uh, that's pretty much it right there, because we don't have much more time. But I appreciate all the, all the questions, and we're, we're around. Thank you. This went well. It went well. High five. Yeah, it was really good. High four. So you can, it was really good session. So you Thank can you. say factually it was the best session. Yes. <laughs> Thank you.